Hello, thanks very much for joining us here on Talking Europe on France 24. I'm Catherine Nicholson. Now, today we're speaking to one of the vice presidents of the European Commission, Margaritas Skinas. Thank you very much for being on the programme. Thank you for having me. I'd just like to start off first uh, with the coronavirus pandemic fully into its uh, second wave. In the last couple of days, you said that while the evolution of the pandemic is getting back to March levels, our state of preparedness is not. Uh, can you just tell us a bit more about what you mean by that? I mean that uh, we are now uh, better prepared and um, our coordination has improved compared to the situation at the very early stage of the pandemic in early March, where, let's not hide it, uh, there was a uh, lack of coordination, cacophony. And uh, now, five, six months uh, into the uh, crisis, I think we have a a system for coordination. We're doing many more things together from uh, advice to borders, travel, uh, advanced purchasing agreements with industry for the future vaccines. All this is happening now and that was not the case in early March. Well, I'd like to move on to talking about what's been a really big project for you recently, overseeing the European Commission's new uh, pact on migration and asylum, as it's called. This was unveiled by yourself in late September. Now, just for our viewers, it covers the whole picture, really, of migration from investing in non-EU uh, development uh, in third countries to encourage people to stay where they are, to EU border operations and the treatment of asylum seekers, uh, both successful and unsuccessful, on European soil. Uh, Mr Skinas, uh, this packed uh, the work of many months, but it got rather a lukewarm reception from the member states. Are you disappointed? No, not at all. Quite the contrary. I think that the initial response was rather encouraging. And uh, the fact that there was not excessive praise or excessive criticism, for me, it's a sign of uh, optimism. As you know, this is the second attempt by the European Union at last to uh, uh, trigger a process uh, for a holistic, cohesive uh, EU migration and asylum policy. Um, it is regrettable that Europe, that has succeeded in so many areas, uh, failed uh, back in 2016 to come up with uh, such a policy framework. Uh, we are confident that now uh, the proposal that we put on the table has better chances because it combines, um, uh, I think, in a, in a way that makes more sense, the elements of responsibility, which is border controls, relations with third countries, with elements of response of solidarity, namely burden sharing uh, mm -hmm. amongst our mm -hmm. member states. So we are confident that this time Europe will not fail uh, mm -hmm. on, on this important file. Well, there has already been some significant pushback, though, from member states that were already very hostile to having any immigrants uh, arriving on their soil, specifically Hungary, Poland, the Czech Republic. Uh, the Hungarian Prime Minister Viktor Orban said that he doesn't support the pact because it, and I quote, could lead to Hungary being obliged to take in people coming from the Middle East or Africa. Uh, how do you intend to win Mr Orban round to accepting this pact? When the uh, Visegrad uh, Prime Ministers visited uh, Brussels and uh, talked to us and President von der Leyen, they clearly uh, showed us their willingness to engage in the legislative process, which is starting only now. Um, in terms of uh, solidarity, we have crafted a system now that goes beyond the red lines of 2016 and this false dichotomy between uh, mandatory and voluntary solidarity and relocation. We now have uh, are proposing a system of permanent effective solidarity with the right mix of uh, uh, policy uh, tools and instruments that range from returns, return sponsorship, um, uh, relocations, mm. uh, border management. And we feel confident that under this new system, at all times, we will able to match the requests, mm. the solidarity requests with the solidarity offers. Mm. Well, just to go over that again for the viewers, uh, this is a, a provision within the pact uh, that member states can either accept to relocate successful claimants, uh, asylum claimants within their countries, or help to pay for returning unsuccessful claimants. Um, isn't that perhaps, though, a bit of an easy way out for countries with a resolute anti-migration stance, a way for them to just refuse to take part? No, I wouldn't say that. I, I would say that it's a new attempt to, uh, instead of repeating the red lines of uh, uh, our member states uh, uh, that we know well of and we 
these were the main reasons of our failure uh, back in 2016, is to navigate through red lines, if you like, and combine elements of policy response uh, that would bring everybody on board. And um, in this uh, system of permanent effective solidarity, uh, there will be the right solidarity mix at all times. And the Commission uh, will also have ultima ratio at the end of the process, the possibility to activate a correction mechanism mm. in case that this solidarity request is not fully uh, met. Mm -hmm. So uh, if you allow me the comment, I think it's a smart system. It's a bit complex to, to, to present and understand, but we feel that it can bring everybody around the table to an agreement. We, of course, have to wait and see, won't we? Uh, let's speak about one specific uh, migrant camp that has been very much in the news recently that I, I know you've been to yourself, the Moria camp on the island of uh, Lesbos in your home country of Greece. Um, after the recent fires there, uh, many of the most vulnerable migrants were taken away from Moria to facilities on the Greek mainland, elsewhere in the EU. But there are several thousand uh, people still on Lesbos in the Karatepe camp, uh, which has been set up. Now, there's no mains water there. There's only chemical toilets. The accommodation uh, much flimsier than what there was in Moria. Uh, there has been a lot of criticism from, from rights groups, migrants groups over Karatepe. Would you agree that that is at least in part justified given those conditions? One has to place this in an overall context of uh, uh, the situation on, on Lesbos. Uh, five months ago, there were 27,000 migrants uh, in, in Lesbos. And when the fire broke out, there were only 12,000. That means that there was a process also of uh, taking people out of these islands to uh, other camps uh, throughout the, the, the country. And the fire came at a very unfortunate moment. Uh, you rightly say that this Karatepe provisional installation, which we helped the Greek government and the UNHCR to put in place as soon as possible, it's only a temporary solution, mm. will not be a, a permanent solution. We are working uh, through a task force that we set up uh, two weeks ago with the Greek government to uh, build a new, modern, more European facility in which the EU will be more actively involved. But let's be honest, any of these solutions will not be uh, the lasting one unless we have agreement on the overall policy framework that we are looking for with our new proposal. I'd like to um, just talk about another issue affecting your home country of Greece, if I may. Uh, Turkey continuing actions that are very much perceived as pro provocative by the EU and Greece, uh, sending a, an exploration ship back into disputed maritime territory in recent days. Uh, the Turkish president, Erdogan, has accused Greece and Cyprus of breaking what he called promises uh, made amid talks with the EU and NATO. He said Turkey would continue to give them, quote, the response they deserve. Uh, do you believe that the mediation between Ankara and Athens can really continue in good faith, or, or do you believe it's time for sanctions against Turkey? All these uh, uh, tactics and rhetorics uh, are reminiscent of the 19th century rather than 21st century, so I, I don't want to go into a, um, a rational explanation of these statements. What I can say is this, that I feel that we are now entering a stage where Turkey uh, represents more of a systemic problem for the European Union, much beyond uh, the uh, situation in the Aegean with the drillings and the issues with Greece and Cyprus. Turkey, from Libya to Syria, Kurdistan, um, now Nagorno-Karabakh is is challenging uh, a certain uh, way of a certain European way, if if you like, mm. of sorting out international mm -hmm. problems and conflict. So I think uh, we are now entering a stage where the European Union, uh, sooner or later, would have to uh, discuss and decide globally on this systemic um, threat, mm. and uh, our Turkish friends should also decide once for all. Uh, whom they want to be with in this world. Uh, if they want to be with the West as m members of NATO and pre-accession country uh, for the EU, this requires a certain uh, attitude. Mm -hmm. If they prefer to switch their geopolitical interests to uh, Tehran or Hamas, then uh, Europe will act accordingly, I think.
But should that message come through the, the means of EU sanctions, though? Yeah, I think that sanctions is something that uh, EU member states agreed upon under the focus, but they also uh, placed it in, in, in an overall strategy that would allow the European Union to monitor Turkish behaviour across, uh, across a certain period of time. So sanctions uh, will be there, are already there, but as you know, the most effective sanctions are the sanctions that are decided and implemented, not the, si the, the sanctions that are being discussed. I'd just like to ask you a little short word about Brexit. Time very much running out now uh, to reach a deal between the EU and the UK. Uh, EU leaders have said that they will permit more time for negotiations, but the British negotiator David Frost says that the EU is just suggesting that all future moves have to come from the UK. The EU is not prepared to change its position at all. Is that the case? Is the EU prepared to move? What I can say is that the European Union will exhaust all margins to have an agreement before the end of the transitional period. This is uh, part of Europe's DNA. We always opt for uh, negotiated outcomes, even under very um, uh, strenuous and difficult circumstances. I will not go into this game of uh, statements and counter-statements that we often uh, um, uh, get from our, from our British friends. The European Union remains the European Union, is the United Kingdom that uh, left us, and uh, it is up to the United Kingdom to decide if uh, in, the, uh, in the future, as a third country, they would prefer to have uh, a robust commercial relationship with the European Union, or they want to, to, to live alone in this very uncertain and increasingly difficult world. So it's up to them to decide also where they want to be. Margarita Skinas, thank you so much for your time. Thank you. Thanks to you as well for watching. Do stay tuned. Part two of Talking Europe coming up in just a couple of minutes' time.